All right, good morning, everybody. Is that too loud or is that good? Thumbs up. All right. Um, yeah, so this presentation evolved when we were first doing the site. Well, actually, backing up a little bit, we've been doing what we've called site characterization since I started at the core in like 2016 or so. And it was way more informal, where we would have mostly just core cadre folks come in and we would pick a different topic that we thought maybe would be um, useful in terms of site characterization, and we'd sort of wing it. So it was very informal, a little more um, less structured like we have now. But every single year we identified as a group, we identified certain topics related to site characterization that we thought that would be useful to train or we were having, I wouldn't say deficiencies, but we were struggling like to make a case, right? To build the case or to create figures or to start using some of the modeling tools. So every year it evolved. And so when we were putting all this together, we happened to be in a point where uh, we were sitting around a room brainstorming and the topic came up of, of mapping. And so how does this fit into where we're going is what we started to see and what I've recognized over my career is that back when, back when I started, we all knew what mapping meant for engineering geology, not necessarily, you know, to solve USGS, build USGS maps and just map bedrock, but what are the structures and the features and the conditions and the site, the site observations that you meet that all tie together that help solve an engineering geology problem at the scale of a, of a dam site. So that's kind of where this came up was, let's see if we can put this thing together and maybe help get people to understand that when we say mapping, it's not just, uh, there's a rock, there's a rock, right? And a lot of times or engineers think that you're gonna go create a USGS map. And that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. So what we're talking about is, in my mind, this should be called engineering geology at that scale that is useful to solve the problems that we need to solve for dam safety. That was a long intro, I'm sorry, but, and, and to be honest, I went through this the last couple of days and it probably has a little more content than is 100% necessary. I think we can streamline it. Input and feedback will be useful. So the overall learning objectives are gonna to be to ultimately describe the intent and applicability of mapping related to risk assessments, I, I do, well, we'll get into that a little bit. Explain how to prepare and plan and then scope a, a field mapping effort and then identify uh, field methodologies and focuses to target your, your field mapping. And then here's the outline. That's pretty much saying the same thing. We're gonna do an intro overview of the intent and applicability of how field mapping can be applied to risk assessments how to prepare for and then implement and then produce mapping products and we have some examples. All right, so overall, when, when we say site characteristics, site characterization, this is often an iterative phased approach. We start out at the desktop study level and we talked a lot about that yesterday and I think the day before where you gather data, pull it together, synthesize it, Evaluate everything you can before you step foot in, in the, on the ground in a field. And you start to develop your geo conceptual model. I underline that because I'm going to describe that a little bit more in detail. All right, then we go, we do our field reconnaissance and our field effort. And we're focused on civil engineering applications. <laughs> That's what applied geology is. How does the geologic conditions influence and affect the civil engineering? efforts that we're trying to solve. That's the target. So we can't lose focus of that. And sometimes, sometimes geologists can lose focus of that. We get, we get, we follow the pretty thing, the, the, the garnet, you know, unless this is a garnet schist or a schisty garnet. Oh, no, you know, we get, we can get wrapped around the axle sometimes and, and lose focus of where we need to be. And then, then sometimes after you do the field mapping, then you can target the field Subsurface investigation, drilling, sampling, testing, and that sort of thing. Um, photogram to tree LIDAR. Step four, obviously, is pull all that data together, reevaluate it, state your conceptual model, which is basically follows the scientific process. You have a hypothesis. This is what we think the geologic 
framework is. These are the things that are important. We go out, we map, we drill, we synthesize it, and then we have to modify our, our, our perception of how we view the, the site geology. And then all this is iterative, right? You go back, you might go back to step two, come back down here, and um, we have to understand that it's a phased approach and things can change. We have to follow the change. So key points would be that, oh, this is, this is where it's going. So when I say engineering geological mapping for risk assessments, that's not, it's not really unique. You don't do anything different. You don't make different observations. It's a risk assessment or you're doing a new dam project somewhere. You, you basically follow the same principles. But um, we will try to talk about how it can inform and help and be assistance, it, it, a benefit to a risk, risk evaluation. Um, this includes doing both two-dimensional and three-dimensional characterization, uh, pulling spatial information together to really depict and communicate what the engineering geology site conditions are to a group of people who um, need to understand it but they may not have that same background, right? You target structural engineers, right, Scott? <laughs> and uh, hydraulic feet folks and hydrology people, everybody needs to understand how, how your perception of the site is in, in, influencing the dam safety or the design or the risk assessment. Uh, again, review and compilation of this. We harp on that a lot because it's so important, making sure you can communicate and you communicate with good graphics and good figures and good plots and good models. Soil and rock are obviously they're geologic materials, but we need to follow um, mapping methodologies. We need to follow the right so I think yesterday, you know, or in our in our breakout session, we're talking about the struggles with how the soils were originally described using a non-USCS methodology, right? And so those two things don't always communicate the same information. And then you're stuck with not, we're stuck with more uncertainty. So that's one thing we're going to focus on too. All these things, this is the graphics, this is the communication part, it's so important to be able to com clearly communicate all your information. So how, do, how can we tell the geologic story and the influences on, say, a failure mode to the decision makers who maybe will see this for a couple minutes <laughs> sometimes, maybe quicker. So we have to be able to be clear and concise and focused in our communication. And then mapping should focus on the factors needed to build and communicate this clear case and justify your, your interpretations and basically re help reduce your uncertainties. So these are the questions to consider before your mapping effort. What are the failure modes or the nodes along your event tree um, that, that we can address? If there's a subsurface issue, if we're trying to look at permeability of the rock at depth, we may not be able to totally tell that from a field mapping effort, but maybe we can look at joints at the surface or, or, or stress relief joints in an abutment, and maybe those might help inform a drilling program, where to go, how to do it, and where to go um, do packer tests, for example. So what part of the failure mode can we actually in the field, make observations and, and, and help support. So what date exists and can be caught, compiled and to further, to further characterize. So that's, that's we, we're harping on that a lot, obviously. Use everything you have available and access to. What data gaps or questions do we need to understand? And can we do that by, by hiking around the site and seeing things? Are there physical, spatially distributed attributes or conditions a mappable features that will inform our risk assessment. And then where are these mappable features likely to be encountered at the site? So you need to identify those things and you have to be able to get to them. So Amy, Amy and I did a project at Bull Shoals and she got out there and we were also doing some geophysics, but we needed to do some rock mass classification and the whole slope's like covered in poison oak, poison ivy. So all of a sudden you're like, nope, that's 
pretty much not going to happen until the fall <laughs> or when the stuff dies off or we can have access to it. What can you get to? And what's safe to get to? A lot of times, you know, you look at a structure in the field or on the Google and you're like, oh yeah, we can just sort of walk down this slope or we can get near this spillway structure and you can't. Or there's security reasons why you can't get there. What field data collection methods and observations are most applicable to su successfully identify and document those features? Um, what do you think you're gonna find? That's always something we ask for in our FIP and DIP Dipper, dipper reviews, right? When people come out with their field plans, we, we like to know when we review them, what do you think you're gonna see in this borehole? You don't have to be right, but what, what, do you, what are your objectives? What do you think you're gonna see? What do you think you're gonna um, come away with? Uh, the benefits of doing field mapping, this, this to me is, is huge. Um, it can be extremely cost effective. Right, so you sit there and you're, we're wringing our hands and we have all this uncertainty over this, this, this condition that we're not sure exists or, or how it influences our failure mode. If you can get someone on the, on the field for one day, two days, and they know what to look for and they know how to document it, then you can reduce uncertainty or you can tie things together with other subsurface data that is really cheap. One person for a day is definitely cheaper than, you know, rigs and geophysics and contractors and contracting that can take months and months. So uh, we need to gather the information uh, and what can help us change or modify our understanding or better characterize that, that risk. That risk that we've um, trying to trying to evaluate. Low cost, reduce uncertainties tie other geologic geotechnical together if you can find features on the surface nuance features little features rock mechanics features geomorphic features but then maybe you can tie those together with some of the subsurface data that you have that, that, that you didn't have that much confidence in you can spatially connect things and build your model in a better way if you can get some good observations on the on the ground and then this informs all the other field investigation type efforts, right? Do we, where and when and how, what are we going to do? Are we going to drill in certain locations? What kind of sampling, what kind of testing is going to be applicable? And we can inform those things by doing field, field mapping, geophysics, trenching as well. And we're going to do a, we're going to do a, a break, not breakout, but like a little exercise after this. So we'll set it all up and we're going to have you then from the data we can present in a short amount of time, you're gonna try to um, put some of that together. What would you do? How would you solve it with the information? All right, these are some examples of where field mapping may benefit the risk characterization. Say the soils, uh, soil stratigraphy and the foundation susceptible to backward erosion piping, perhaps in the field or in a cut or upstream or downstream, we can start to see some fluvial examples of, of the deposit physical deposit, you can see the channelization, you can, you can see the three dimensionality of a deposit that may be buried under the dam. Uh, what's the abutment rock? Is the abutment rock capable of moving, moving materials, right? So do we have karst features? What's the extent of karst? What's the magnitude and the, the, the spatial distribution of karst? Is it significant or is it and is it in a specific unit or, or does it exist in the foundation? Same with rock joints uh, or maybe an open framework type gravel. We can maybe, we can put some of that information together by walking the ground and documenting it on, on maps. Is there some potential for erosion and undermining due to like overtopping or flanking of a, of a spillway structure or, or an embankment? We can gather the data necessary to go into those erodibility index parameters that, that we've seen the last couple of days, either Annandale or Pels. We can collect that in the field to try to better characterize that, that parameter. Is there foundation or abutment structural stability issues? Rock mechanics, um, foundation sliding on bedding planes, for example. You know, how continuous, how open, what's the real strength of those? What's that big picture eye angle that you add on to your, to your friction? You know, if you have some undulating beds or you have um, 
a dip on the bed, that may really help with the stability analysis. You get to add some, add some friction back into your, to your low strength material, perhaps. We can look for issues with lined and unlined spillways, again, for soil and rock erosion. Uh, settlement or heave of structures. Um, we were talking the other night, or yesterday, about, about Prado, right? Prado Dam has all these beds that are going through. If you know the structure of the beds, you may not be able to see the foundation, but you can go into abutments or you can go away from the structure and start to put your section together. And maybe that projects into the dam foundation and maybe we can put some sort of concepts to which units might have heave or blaze or high swelling potential. And we can project those. Landslides, of course, fault, fault rupture and, and liquefaction issues at a site. All these things we can, we can try on the ground to put some more information and reduce our uncertainties. So we have a lot of different focuses for, for engineering geology mapping. It's not always just what is the rock unit there, but we might need to know something about engineering geology, geotechnical, or even environmental mapping can be instrumental in understanding flows and, and contamination and where things are coming from or where they're going. Uh, geomechanical mapping, this is like getting the rock mechanics components pulled together for erodibility, for stability, for deformation modulus. Geomorphic, um, geomorphological mapping, and, and again, Justin was talking a lot about this, being able to look at the ground surface, look at breaks and slope, look at features, look at, look for maybe say glacial features, look for slope movement features, that the ground expresses the conditions that might be in the subsurface or the, the processes that might have been going on at one point and where features are and what they mean. Is it a, is it a, is it an end moraine or is it a ablation or a basal till? Those things all have different engineering properties. So we might be able to put those things together. Hydrogeology, groundwater often in rocks, it's mostly flowing through the rock joints and uh, the fractures for the most part. Uh, maybe it'll go through a bed. A tiny little clay seam in a sand, fractured sandstone might be enough to be an aquitard, right? You can perch water on top of that, and it might not show up in all drill holes. Maybe you can go somewhere inside, you can see this feature. Bentonite seam happens in Colorado all the time in some of the rock units we have, and it can change how the water moves through the system. Uh, geohazards, these are, I always characterize these, these are predictive. We're trying to predict a condition that might not exist at a site. So whether it's landslides or heaving ground or um, yeah, the earthquakes or fault rupture or something, we're trying to predict the problem that might someday cause us to have an issue or maybe it's influencing a failure mode. We don't have that activity actually happening yet. We're trying to predict that it is or isn't potential at the site. Then there's a construction foundation mapping. So all this effort doesn't, you know, I always say that construction is, or site characterization doesn't end once it goes into design. And a lot of you probably know this, you learn a lot during construction. You open things up, you actually see what's really there. So investigations and site characterization goes on into, um, into construction for sure. And then that beyond the geological engineering and um, attributes. What I mean by that is a lot of times there's features in the ground or features that you see that might tie information together. So that really is, this to me is kind of key. And when we say, let's go map, a lot of times people forget this. I'm gonna show examples. Um, no theory can be considered satisfactory until it has been adequately checked by actual observations. So, so we have these concepts, we sit in rooms, we do failure modes, we look at all this old data. Maybe we do a site visit. I mean, that's usually part of a failure mode assessment or PFMA. You go put boots on the ground, you hike it. So you do sort of get to check these things. But when you go out with a map and with GPS and you're putting things together, especially that might help to tell a story or a little better and improve our uncertainties. All right, so planning the field mapping. What are the risk driving failure modes? Which event tree nodes might have mappable attributes that you can see somewhere in the, in the site? Again, I say look beyond the footprint of your structure. 
look upstream, look downstream. I have lots of examples where you don't see outcrops in and around your region, but a half mile up the road or in the reservoir, you see those outcrops and you can project them onto sections, onto maps, and the observations you make might be applicable into the foundation. The type of PFM you're, you're targeting is uncertainty related to structural, surface erodibility, slake, stability, strength, internal erosion, characterize the vulnerabilities or potential susceptibilities to refine the risk assessment. Is that what our objective is? Define and characterize the uncertainties with respect to the risk assessment. What features or engineering properties are key to inform a node or a, or a concept or a, or a failure mode um, sequence? Then identify the features that are mappable. What are, are there likely spatial features, site conditions, and locations that may inform the PMF? And again, go, go away from your site because geology is often at a large scale and you can find similar features that might inform your, your site collection. Uh, take all the re existing available data and make sure you have your site concept and your model built and, and an understanding of what you think you're going to find and see. I think I can go through that. We've, we've, we've talked a lot about that already. Then you want to target your field mapping efforts because you do want to be efficient. You don't want to get stuck in, in, a, in a rabbit hole. You don't want to get distracted by something that might not be helping the, the analysis. Um, I have a lot of examples of this. I've worked in South America a lot. And we, would have these, we would have geologists just arguing about the, the, the mineral composition of what's really a granite. To, 20,000 PSI granite, and they, they, they get heated arguments. They're, they're mostly trained in mineralogy, and they'll battle forever about whether it's a gabbro or a diorite. And um, at some point, it kind of doesn't matter. That part doesn't matter. So we need to make sure we focus on the things that, that do matter. It's mostly the fractures and the deformation and fault zones and weathering. Uh, select the appropriate tools and people to do this work. Everybody, every geologist, so that we can go around and have a good discussion. People have different exposures to field mapping, different abilities and things that they see or, or are able to document or put on a map, put your pencil on a map. You used to have a professor, and if you couldn't put your, your pencil tip where you thought you were, if you were hesitant to do that, no matter how, how mean he was, you, uh, you needed to keep, keep thinking about a project. So, these are all those lists. This is a, for the planning. Don't need a harp on it. Oh, site access limitations, safety issues are always important. Um, also, maybe coordinating with the site operations. That's huge. They need to know what you're doing, why you're doing it. Just don't show up to a, a project for the most part and just start walking around because all of a sudden the security folks show up. Conduct the field investigations, right? So use tools that we've mentioned already, these layering model, model layering tools, Google, ArcMap, some others. Build your spatial model so that you can tell where things are gonna be. You might even start with some origin, some cross sections, maybe build a few cross sections before you go into the field, and take those plans with you and you can modify, you can map on a cross section also while you're doing mapping on a plan view. Multiple working hypothesis, so that's key. Um, I've been, I've, I've struggled sometimes where you think you see something, you think you have an idea of how the structure is or, or that it must be faulted or sheared or that's related to plutonic or, or organ placement. It's really complicated working in mines, mine areas because the geology is just really messed up. It's really mangled because of that's how ore gets to the surface. There's faults and intrusions and it's hard to always know what you're looking at. So you got to change your perspective a lot of times. Uh, perform the field investigation. Make sure it's adding to your site understanding. And then this is iterative again and refine and update your conceptual model. I think it was Damien was talking about what a conceptual model is. When we talk about it, it's not to be confused with an analytical, numerical, computational, or a, or a 
you know, a software type model. That's not what we mean. What we mean is developing a three-dimensional depiction of the spatial conditions, the physical attributes, geometry, engineering properties, what are the physics at the site and how they're controlling things like groundwater flow or, or uh, stability and make sure they conform and account for the, the setting. You have, to, you have to fit that model into the field observations and in and, and the geologic setting and the depositional or emplacement uh, history. Interpretation communication of the site data and conditions is important. And the model helps you do this. It's a graphical section. It's plan view maps. It's, uh, it's pulling those things together so you can communicate to everybody. And these need to be sufficiently detailed, need to be defensible, and need to be able to make sense and verifiable. Like Justin was saying, if you have a cross section in one area and you have another cross section crossing it, those where they cross should match. It shouldn't be different on those those intersections. And capture and portray the subsurface variability at uh, a level relevant to the project scope. So I always say map and look at things at the scale of the failure mode or at the scale of the of the project. So if if a small fracture, tiny little fracture, if you're mapping teeny tiny little fractures that don't have continuity to them, maybe that's not where you focus. Maybe you need to focus on the fractures that have tens, fifteens, hundreds of feet of continuity and might be more applicable to whatever your failure mode is. Compile, organize all this qualitative and quantitative conditions to support or refute specific failures. So that's how the geologic model is developed and that's what happens and we go back and we re revisit it and always be updating that geologic model. This is a failure mode event tree and in this slide we can kind of see that we have node one is the flaw, the existence of the flaw, location of the flaw. A lot of times in the failure mode we'll assume that it's a worst case scenario and exists in a specific area and um, we're, we're, we're theorizing because in the, like we've seen in the last couple of days, when you have a, a initial SQI and you're, you're, you're spending short amount of time, you, you, tend to, you tend to err on the side of conservatism because of uncertainties. So does it exist? Is it in the right location for this failure to go? Does it have the continuity and persistence that uh, is necessary for, say, a CLE or, or a erosion into a rock mass? So those are targeted parts of the event tree that we can um, maybe inform with, with just a day or two days of field work, maybe even digging some holes with by, by hand. Pull all this stuff together, here's a whole list of things that sometimes get pulled into a geologic or, or a Google Earth model or a GIS model or other type of model. Everything you can, make sure it's spatially located and everything synthesized together. So the other some planning. Obviously, we can get to aerial photos. We can look at topography and in the in the topo expression. If you understand what landslide geomorphology looks like, you can start. That's that's that's, a, that's an example. You can start to identify slope features, slope movements. You do this, and then you go out in the field and you actually try to look for those features in the ground. Is it really a landslide, or does it just happen to be the topography is? is controlled by something other than, than sliding. And then um, like lineations, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of mapping lineations, whether or not it's a real feature or not. You do this uh, ahead of time. So this is an example of that. You, you pull up your aerial photos or your LIDAR or whatever you have access to, and you just kind of, this is my, my, my opinion, not everybody maybe does this, but you kind of, I'm gonna say go crazy. You can start to see lineal type of features that might reflect the underlying geologic structure. They might under under they might be controlling the, the geomorphology. So you can pull these together and it's surprising how many times you can just do lineal lineation mapping on the field, document things. Maybe you get more data and drill hole data and all sorts of stuff starts to actually make sense. Not every lineation I pick is 
exactly some feature that I can interpret. The, the underlying structure is a fractal, like in rock mechanics, the stresses break the rock and what I call, you know, all scales. So lineation mapping is pretty invaluable. And all the existing data, pull it all together, layer it, um, synthesize and evaluate, make sure you have a good handle on it. Um, we were talking yesterday about the really nice geologic maps that we have for a lot of projects. Some, sometimes they spent incredible amount of time, effort and detail on the foundation mapping. And they identified all these features, all these shears, they named them, they have orientation data on them. Then a lot of times we don't have anything, zero in, in, in a dam. Um, Shoals was like that, where we could not find any foundation mapping for a very large concrete gravity dam. I'm positive it exists, but we just couldn't get our hands on it anywhere. A lot of times the, the lineation or the fracture and mapping will, can reflect also where groundwater flows might be persistent. Um, if you're doing car studies, this is kind of where everybody starts. You start trying to see these features lining sinkholes up and seeing if all those are following a fracture pattern and then maybe you actually can predict where and why and how karst systems are going to impact your your efforts or your failure mode um, construction photographs are invaluable uh, when i was at Bureau reclamation and they were doing all this abutment rock wedge stability analysis this is all we had you know the, the abutment's buried there it's underwater so this is a project up in British Columbia where there was an intake tower poured against this wall. And uh, in the PFMA review, we start seeing what looked like rock wedges behind this high seismic area. And the, the intake tower, here's the intake tower, was not anchored to that wall. So the, the, the worry was the tower was going to basically sh move and then fail. So we wanted to anchor it, but we didn't want to anchor it into a block would also come out. So anyway, what we did is take these construction photos of a bunch of them from different locations and orientations. And if you can pinpoint in the middle where, where things are, you can actually kind of roughly pull off what you think might be a strike and dip, a planar feature in a construction photo. We wrote a paper about this. It was published in ARMA. Um, my methodology was for, for doing that, and I have that paper if anybody cares. And then again, aerial air, air photo and geomorphic interpretation of the ground features and the ground shapes and the, the topography is another way you can predict or you can plan your mapping when you try to map it or identify features ahead of time. This is at a Libby mine in Montana, and um, they, they didn't mine a pit. At Libby Mine, at the Vermiculite Mine, they mined along the contours of the existing hill slope. And then these were like all these waste dumps. But as we started to look closer at the waste dumps, we started seeing that there's a lot of potential movement, a lot of potential landslides. There's what look like ground cracks and scarps. There's hummocky areas of where the, the ground has been shifted and compressed and is irregular. And so then what we did, and this was really important because this was full on hazmat type work. So then you're in respirators for only a certain amount of time. So we could get up here and we could go target these features and try to assess what the stability and the mechanics and the geometry of that, of that landslide may be. So then we could put it on cross sections and then we could figure out how to kind of divert all the water around the toes without destabilizing those structures. Right. So now we're going into the field. We've got all of our plans. We have a targeted thing we're looking for. You need all your tools, of course. We don't need to spend much time on this. This was this is mostly we had this discussion last night. GeoID, you know, there's a lot you can do on a phone now or a tablet. Um, these can these can collect spike and dips, and you can get a ton of data really quick. Say the most important thing is correlate it with the thing you're comfortable with it with a field compass, a real compass, or bun. I don't know if you have something. This was, we, we actually had this discussion last time. So what are the tools you need to bring with you? Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, I, you have such a role. I was like, no, I can't interrupt him. But uh, No, I'm fine. But, but, with it. 
Um, it's a question about scale. So you talked about like determining like what's the appropriate scale to map things. And yeah. it's like one of these things I think that is uh, hard for people to decide, like what feature do I go look at in the field? What's important? So I was wondering, and there's a question at the end of this, um, and it's like, what advice do you have to, to decide that? But uh, the thing I was gonna say is like, uh, there's a Tozagi paper, like minor defects paper, that kind of gives some uh, information about how you decide like what's an important feature, how it affects the failure mode or the behavior of the dam. But how the heck do you decide like what, if you go to the field and you're looking at cracks for a landslide, what's an important feature that deserves like a spot on the map? Like how do you decide that? That's, a, I, I think, oh man, I, I'm not sure how to totally answer that because I can talk myself in a circle to be honest because I, from one perspective, I, I go at it and say, I, I don't really know what features are going to be important once we pull all this information together. And it can be little minor features that are telling you something else about a process or something else about a, a larger, larger feature or condition that might be influential. And I kind of have examples of that later, but you, you often don't know what things are important and not important when you're when you're in the field collecting that information. Same with rock coring. You know, do you need to do every single little bed or seam? Maybe it's not important, but you don't know what's important until you pull it together. Um, on the same note, you know, the failure modes that involve dams tend to have some sort of continuity and spatial um, spatial extent that, that, that will facilitate the, the failure mode. In Denison, we need that sandy material to have some sort of continuity in, in a three-dimensional space. So we do kind of have an idea what our scale is of, of a failure mode that we need. You don't know what nuance feature might inform that when you start pulling it all together. So I just didn't answer your question. <laughs> uh, let's see, what are we doing? Data to collect. Uh, general and site specific engineering features. You need photographs all the time. Take photos of stuff, photos, photos, photos. We have this ability now to take thousands of photos and not run out of photo taking space, right? It used to be old school where it was a uh, camera and you had 24 if that was about all you had. Now, take pictures of everything. I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, GPS points, spatial locations, like precise locations, not, you know, I mean, I'm not the greatest mapper I know. I know plenty of people, people in this room who are probably better putting yourself on a map or identifying on a topo or, or aerial photo exactly where you are and how, how a dipping bed strikes up across a, a steep topography, right? It's It's not super easy, but, GPS can help you a lot. You can GPS points, you can GPS a scan line and get the front and ends, and then you can pull your stuff back together. So GPS helps you fix things when you get back into an office setting and you can. Um, field measurements, obviously. Document the engineering characters, characteristics of the features you're talking about. There's a lot of methodologies, Bureau, you know, uh, STM, they tell us how to describe soils and how to describe rock and how to describe joints and what, what verbiage to use. And I'd say it's important for consistency to make sure we use those standards because then others understand what you're talking about. And then no, obviously notable features. Uh, yeah, this is a sort of a pre-checklist. What are the conditions that you might need to be considering when you're moving out and planning for. You want to map to pop topographic expression and topographic features, breaks and slope, variable topography. I mean, in a perfect, perfect slope setting, you know, the, the, the erosion would come straight down and it would all be uniform and the, and the drainages would all be straight into a main gully, but we know that's not true. And it's all controlled sometimes by the underlying conditions. Um, obviously the geologic features, these are all the, these are all the, con all the uh, um, 
supporting information that would go into defining the geologic conditions. Um, so weather, what sort of erosion happens here? What's the temperature? And this, I think, in my mind, this is more like um, feeds into the, the degree of weathering, the depth of weathering and the type of weathering that you might have, right? It's different in a jungle or humid environment than it is in, in really dry one. You have different weathering processes and magnitudes. Groundwater, I don't know why it, so it does say vibration. I can't remember why. Oh, I guess that's the seismic component. And then history of slope changes over time. Changes are huge. Changes are really important for all damn safety. Anything that changes, either suddenly or over time, those are always got to be red flags for us to kind of investigate and have an answer for why. Again, follow the common soil and rock engineering descriptions. There's a lot of them out there, and um, there's a lot of tools and a lot of ways to describe soil and rock following, following ASTM, USCS, or, or these rock mechanics methodologies. The reason it's important because you can back out and understand what that description means, and it might have other criteria associated with it that informs your, your, your assessment. Uh, a bunch of examples of what I mean by that symbology. There's tons of information out there and tons of ways to show seepage, show movement, show breaks in slope, show enclosed depressions, show rumply, hummocky skin, um, topography, skin, <laughs> what am I talking about? Uh, landslides, active landslides, debris flows, block falls, uh, rock mechanics type wedges, um, break uh, scarps, all these sorts of symbols are in our geologic handbook to use to express and show what we mean, what we're seeing on the surface. Strike and dips, foliations, types of bedding, upturn, um, vertical or overturned. There's all these symbols, and we can't not use them if these features exist, because that's telling the story, that's communicating what's going on to, to people in the, in the future, too, who are going to use this risk assessment. And then we also have to know what our processes are for evaluating either soil or rock. You know, if we are trying to get to rock mass classifications or we're trying to get to erodibility, make sure we're collecting that information. And maybe we're collecting it based on rock unit, like we saw yesterday at Foster Dam. They had erodibility based on the units. Maybe we need to look at it versus depth, um, that sort of thing. Uh, good notes, so it's always important. Um, this, I, I was terrible at doing notes and drawing pictures. It was a lot of work You stand there a long time. You're writing down sometimes your GPS study. But when I started working in South America a lot, that was the only way we were communicating was drawing pictures for each other. So we ended up with loads and bookloads of just drawing pictures and then agreeing on what we were seeing. That's kind of how I learned Geology Spanish, geology Spanglish really was talking with, with Peruvian geologists and we were going through all these things and here's our project and here's what I'm seeing. Are you seeing the same thing? Yes or no, you know, you can go back and forth. So drawing pictures for me was huge for that. I think this is a Damien slide. So um, also understanding the timeline and relationships of past and current events, uh, the activities, construction features can also help understand the, the site conditions. So what I mean by that is, what are the local drainage patterns? Have they changed over time? Where's surface water and where's surface water flowing? Are there irrigation processes um, that are important? So leaking pipe somewhere might be something that we would map. You see a pipe that's got a big leak or a drainage ditch that's overflowing in the area. It looks like it's done it for a while. That might help you understand what's triggering the landslide, for example. Um, are there surrounding developments, land use patterns, um, runoff patterns from a, a development are sometimes really critical. Um, what's happened over recent weather events? Are there little debris flows or smaller, smaller rock slides or rock off a cut slope? And does that relate to what? What events, or does it relate to something else? Is it seasonal? Um, construction history, infrastructure, layouts. Where are roads, cuts, fills, pipelines, culverts, structures? Culverts, even a road culverts might help you answer a question that comes up later on. So in my mind, all these things are part of 
space, there's spatial features that we can map in the field. When you see them and you have an observation, you think, oh, maybe this is related to a problem we're solving. Put it on the map and document it because it might all tie everything together before, um, before the end, once you, once you synthesize information. All right, let me see the, take the photos. Um, this is just because I've, I've, I've made this mistake where I, sitting there writing the report and I didn't take a picture of this one thing that now I, I can't remember it. Or grab samples too, bring samples of the rock or the soil with you. Um, take close up pictures and scale back far away pictures. You gotta have scale or some sort of reference in there so that you can go and you can actually measure some stuff later. The, the photos help when you're back in the office and the, the sites hundreds of miles away and you forgot what the, that was. So take pictures, take pictures. Think ahead to the reporting part. This is something I've learned too, is I think ahead at, in our justification or in making a presentation, whether it's to the cadre or, or to, uh, to decision makers, when you're taking a picture, is that something you're gonna be able to annotate and show and communicate what issues you saw and where it is. It doesn't have to be the map. It can be an annotated feature that really communicates maybe more simply. Uh, use the photos and GPS to define geometry, um, directions of movement, for example, right? So here we have scarp that's down at near at the bottom of a, uh, a landslide. And we have Inside, or we have rotational features. So the direction of things that are moving, you can also map those with notes or with, with arrows or with vector type uh, evaluations. So field uh, general geology in my mind, so this is like a USGS map. And this is kind of what I feel like when, 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 when it comes up and when we say, hey, let's go do mapping at a site. I think a lot of engineers Sure, USGS map. Let's just map the rock units. Um, and we're going to get this pretty map with all these different colors, and these are different rock types and that sort of thing. That's sort of what I mean. I think what I'm trying to emphasize is that there's a lot more details at the scale of this dam that we can, um, that we can add that might help us understand better what the mechanics are, what the what the processes are that are controlling a failure mode. Um, I do have, I have examples and I kind of wish I had thrown them in here, but I've got two projects, Tom Davidson was on one of them. They were both in South America um, where the geology and the cross sections were kind of like this. It was just colors of the contacts and the rock was all yellow, right? The whole mountain at the Itawango was all one color. They didn't map fractures. They didn't even pull stuff off the logs for RQDs. They didn't have they had a little bit of a weathering line, but that was it. So we asked for their geology. It was just this big pink blob. But it wasn't pink blob. It had bedding layers, like every two or three feet. So those weren't depicted. It had some bedding layers that had huge seams and, and poor materials between them or weathering between them and they didn't pick to pick that stuff so they, they mapped the geology but they didn't map the engineering characteristics that were important to the problem that needed to be solved there uh, these are just lists of all the hydrogeologic features that you might need to pay attention to if it's a seepage issue i don't need to read through them all um, this is sort of self Explanatory, and this is all provided in the in the in the handout. Um, this is one thing that I think we'll see in a little bit when when Jen gives gives her discussion. But you can see areas of precipitation, previous water flow, previous springs, and seepage is important. Graphic and lidar features, ridges and drainages, breaks and slope. Tonal variability in, in LIDAR, you can see this, or textural variability. The LIDAR is really cool where you can see rock units or process, excuse me, processes or where soils develop just based on the, the texture of the LIDAR itself. Um, paleo channels, like we were talking about yesterday, glacial deposits and features. 
fractures, lineations. This was, this was important when we started looking at um, things like eskers and moraines. You could start to, if we map the moraine crests, we could see the retreat. We could see the retreating um, glacial, uh, glacial, gl glacial lobe. And then from those, we could see inset eskers under, a, under another um, moraine advance, right? So we could start to pull those things together if we um, map, the, map the crest. This is um, a LIDAR depiction uh, trying to show that the texture, the textural difference between the volcanic flows that were once down a valley, right? And now the erosion has gone away from the filled in volcanics. So down into this area. So we can depict this. We might also then when we have tunnels or we have features crossing, you know, what's underneath that volcanic flow, the flow, it might be old soils, remnant soils, or even a um, drainage deposit or a gravel deposit could be sitting underneath that, that volcanic lobe. Again, geomorphic, I'm not gonna go there too long. Um, this is again, kind of reiterating, reiterating Justin's discussion. If you know the depositional system and you can depict them and identify the different features, those relate to some degree to engineering properties for a failure mode or for assessment or analysis. For example, marine, marine materials or LUS has certain engineering characters, characteristics so if you are on the geology cadre and you see that these are, this is just an example, if you see that these are different types of, of depositional systems, you can infer what sort of problems or physics or, or conditions might be influential to the, to the failure mode. Sections um, through alluvial fans, they can be extremely complicated, right? Fans build over time and they have pulses of debris flows, they have overbank levee deposits, and so the, the cross section can get really super ugly. This is a weird diagram, but like there's section B, right? These are all little lenses of features creating this domed, domed set. Um, I know Justin was part of these, these detailed mapping studies in California where they were able to depict all these terraces, all these inset features, and made really detailed maps in, in Sacramento. Uh, geomechanics features, um, obviously fault shears, map cut slopes, top of cut, you know, engineered cut, cut slopes are often important to depict the, the upper and bottom part of the, the blasted zone, um, rock mass stuff, scan line cell mapping, I'll show you what that looks like real quick, weak and strong zones, weathered zones, again, the lineations, one thing that's really important in my mind is if we're doing a rock mechanics evaluation is to look for what are called molds or casts. So these are features where in a cut slope, you can see blocks have already come off the slope and they are controlled probably by joint sets, joint features. Those joint features probably exist at small scale, may exist at a larger scale that might inform something like a stability analysis. So. So how blocks come off a slope probably reflects a potential larger, larger scale issue. So keep that stuff in mind. Slick and slide, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, rock, rock mechanics, this is a quick kind of brief overview of rock mechanics. There's two, I try to, I try to talk about rock mechanics, two totally separate um, components, right? We have, Discontinuities, the fractures and the tectonic stresses that crack the rock, those are the discontinuities. Analyzing discontinuities, we follow one path. <laughs> we look at the surface roughness and infilling and how that discontinuity might have shear strength across its surface. But then we also have rock mass, which is broken up by hundreds, thousands of rock fractures. And that's analyzed using a different methodology. So in other words, we don't use rock mass classification systems to understand the mechanics of a discontinuity, right? The strength of it. 
we use rock mass to look at a big scale of how a rock's going to behave, kind of like, I say like a soil, but soil-esque, right, where it fails through discontinuities, but then also through some intact rock and that sort of thing. So anyway, there's a lot of different methods out there. Mass rating is one of them, RMR. Q, which is the rock mass quality, and these are all kind of developed by different practitioners. And this is the, the GSI, Geologic Strength Index, and it has a graphical representation. With all of these, and particularly with GSI, and the kind of reason I, I do like it, I know it has limitations, but you can map a slope or a feature or a foundation or a spillway erodibility area where, where water's flowing. You can kind of map with these graphical representations of what these different zones look like and all of those descriptions. And then, then, like I said, so so these also fall into Annandale's um, rock erodibility index. So those parameters and all these things in the field, you can make documentation of. You can evaluate it, map it, uh, measure measure it. Go real quick through here. This is what's called a um, cell a cell mapping. So you pick an area, pick a known dimension of a window. And you do multiple sections, vertical and, and horizontal sections, and you measure discontinuities along those sections, and you can slowly build your information that supports the rock mass classification, whether it's spacing or infilling or what are the discontinuities doing and how does that in, get you to the rock mass system. These are other ways to do cell mapping, um, sheets, or scan line sheets. A scan line is just one of those lines across a rock face, and you do the measurements at known known locations and intervals, and you can pull out the rock mass. Uh, I've seen this already, the Annandale rotability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a kind of cool map I, I got from a colleague who did some of the, they mapped the Orville spillway based on the rock mass erodibility. So they went into the field and they assessed it and they evaluated what types of material, the weathering and the moderately weathered and highly fractured and then the, the, the kind of fresh material. And they mapped it in the channel all the way up to, you know, the base of that, that overflow structure. So now they have a good sense on where the erosion happened, why it happened, where it did, and they can track that, that those erodibility zones across the site. Um, again, you can map using GSI. This is an example of that, the way we use this South America. We, we mapped all the major discontinuities and major structural features in the dam foundation. But we didn't map every single little joint and structure. What we did was we lumped it then into these zones where you can go back and tell kind of where you are in terms of the rock mass, in addition to having large scale features mapped in the foundation. Uh, Rotability index using RMR, or GSI, or MEI. This is another mapping tool. If you can use these depictions, you can map based on the, the, the grade of that material for rotability studies. This is what I meant by those casts or molds. You can also look at old construction photos and identify where blocks have been plucked or moved off of a surface. And those joint sets are very likely what controls a lot of other um, structural features you might be interested in. Geomorphic and landslides, um, sort of a basic background in how, what you look for when you're doing landslide mapping. Um, ground features, uh, topography, so you can do a lot of this in the office and you can look at the, the shape of the topography, you can look at shape of the LIDAR and you can start to identify perhaps where landslides exist. Then of course, Here's the other things. These are the these are the other things to look for, right? So if you're out mapping and you see trees that are bent or are split, distressed or offset structures, um, those things should be mapped as well. So that's what I mean when I say map beyond the features. You know, map map observations, not just not just the geologic features. Geohazards, this is related to susceptibility mapping. So this is predictive. We want to know what the slopes, slopes and slope angles are. Um, where, where's there some, where's the low line areas? And you could have flow, flood issues, debris flow hazards, 
Um, you, can, you can map all these in a predictive sort of way using tools in the office and tools available, but also in the field, you can look for the features that support some of these. Um, for liquefaction mapping, this is, um, this is often, uh, tables like this are often used because they have data sets where you know the type of deposit, if you can map the type of deposit, also the age and the depth of the deposit, you can correlate those two liquefaction susceptibility to some degree. Fault rupture and rupture assessment, fault shaking, hazard shaking. I know that there's a lot of work in California where we need setbacks or we need to know where if the fault exists in a dam foundation or near, near our features. And then going into construction, um, during construction, you need to map issues that arise, uh, features that weren't expected, um, you need to document uh, conditions and, and for example, we're doing this how we have full time people on projects during dam construction. They're mapping foundations on a continuum basis and always, always documenting what they're seeing and issues that are found. That's another construction related feature. Okay, I'm getting there. <laughs> I promise. Okay, so other features too non, non geologic features that will maybe tell the story or you tie into the geology or you tie into the failure mode and they might give some answers or give some direction, right? Lineations again, these might indicate water flow, fracture zones, fault zones, features that are underlying structures, areas of cut and fill. This is really important for a lot of, a lot of projects. When you're in the field, you can kind of tell where cuts, cut slopes and fills are along a road. And maybe we can map where the fill is relative to other, other things we're trying to understand. In an air photo, you might not know where that fill, but it's how it's covering up something else or that it's even a fill, fill feature. Uh, area of moisture, these are called phreatophytes. So this is where vegetation grows. Uh, usually, in an unusually uh, excessive way, right? You, you get water seepage and that's where the, the vegetation is growing like crazy, cattails and other sort of thing. So su other support type systems, if there's retaining walls or slope features or drainage features, you might wanna just document that on your, in your photos or in your, in your, on your map and show what sort of retaining systems were used. Culverts and pipes, irrigation features, vegetation growth. Areas of deformed features, bent trees, offsets, and cracking, natural ground, asphalt, or concrete structures. This is a, a plan view of a concrete line spillway structure. And when we, it's hard to see, but we went in there and we mapped all the cracks and we can map the offset in the offset direction. And ultimately, when we plot this crack mapping onto the geologic maps, it lined up really well with, and the measurements and the sets lined up really well with what we we're seeing in inclinometers and another other slope failure features. It all started to come together with that. All right, deliverables and products. I am gonna jam through this, I promise. <laughs> and this is gonna be a little long. So how are you gonna communicate this information to the design team or the, the Okay, how are you gonna communicate all this information to the design team or the, uh, the, the cadre or other information? We gotta get all of this on the maps and sections and what, what works best. Sometimes simple is better, sometimes complicated. How does it affect and influence the failure mode? We need to sort of come up with those concepts and project them and communicate them well. Developing good figures, this is, this is really, really important. So be, be, always be thinking about how you're gonna most simply communicate information in figures. Figures tell a story way better than a bunch of words and descriptions sometimes. And think of ways to take complex geologic conditions and make them understandable to multiple, multiple disciplines. So these are some of the options that we have. Um, hand-drawn sections and, and depictions. This is kind of how, how I, a lot of us kind of grew up doing that sort of thing, made, making two scale as detailed um, 
depictions of, of what we're seeing as possible. But now we have other tools. We have Google Earth, which is something even I can use, <laughs> and PowerPoint. Uh, other, other, other graphical creation type softwares, Illustrator, Photoshop, all these down through, uh, through the open ground cloud, which is where we are now. And Amy's gonna talk about some of that and what we can do with that moving forward. This is an example of a field rock mechanics um, mapping program where outcrops, uh, some test pits, and um, I don't know, other exposures were mapped. So they, they got spacing, they got discontinuity orientations, uh, openness, and got all the rock mechanics um, features described at each of these locations. And then all of it's plotted on a stereo net. So really, you can kind of start to see how this all ties into perhaps a, a seepage or an internal erosion type failure mode. We saw this the other day mapping uh, erodibility zones in the abutment. Mapping and documenting uh, landslide features and structural features and, and drawing and annotating figures and slides and maps building cross sections as you go, annotating on the cross sections, trying to build your understanding of the site. This was a rockfall hazard project in New Jersey where there was all these overhanging quartzite features sitting right up above the, the portal, downstream portal for a penstock and a lot of rockfall issues through here. So we needed to identify where the rockfalls were uh, most likely um, and then map those in the cliff face and then start to look at the topography and, and you know there's a certain capture zone that we know would impact the, the penstock and from this point we could build barrier system that would uh, be, be reasonable it would it would capture all the rockfall we don't need to capture rockfall over here up there not the whole area just just the capture zone for those rockfall events North Springfield, I think we saw this the other day. This is the dam geomorphic and map that was developed using, I think that's supposed to say GIS. Oh, wait, that is. Test pits and cross sections, those are also mapping efforts. Um, I always see test pits where um, it's a verbal description of, of the materials encountered, but Please know there's something in there. There's some feature in there. There's some, some subtle thing that might have got missed or or uh, not documented. So um, I, I do like to see details, like nuanced details, like where's the gravels, where's the where's seepage, where's, uh, where's contacts between soil units and that sort of thing. This was pulling together three-dimensional type concepts to be able to communicate to a, to a group for risk assessments. We were looking at rock blocks potentially existing in the dam foundation, trying to identify where we might have areas that during seismic and hydraulic loading event, we could have potential issues or where do we need to target our, our, our investigations. Again, um, another area depicting steepage flow paths and using monitoring wells and well elevations to, and actually some um, geochemistry to try to map where we might be having seepage that's coming out from this tailing dam. Um, and this is, this is pre-dam pre construction. So we use the pre-dam construction and we can tie in discontinuities and fault features and we can maybe try to predict where, how, when seepage is gonna exit the system. Geologic cross sections invaluable. And they're really good to have in the field as you can update them as you're walking along these profiles and seeing different units and uh, understanding where they all fit together. And again, the cracking of a structure, crack mapping is really important. I think we, 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 we say we're going to map cracks sometimes, and I've seen, seen these areas where or these spillways, and it's too general. It's not as detailed as I would. I think I'm really almost done, I promise everybody. There, look at that. All done. All right, so the key takeaways for me are, are that the geological, geotechnical understanding, communication, and input is critical for improving dam safety decisions at all levels. 
We shouldn't underestimate the ability or the, the, the value of having somebody spend a couple days in the field who can document, pull these things together, pull these observations together, and then communicate and present the op observations and maybe start to make connections with, with other features or other, other site observations that, that might tell a story better. So that's sort, of, that's sort of it. Communicate, communicate, communicate. So that's, that was the end of that. I was a little long. I, I'm going to change that, I think, for next year. I promise. We'll get more to the, more to the point. No worries, buddy. That was there's a lot of a lot that goes into to mapping, and part of what we're trying to do too is leave you all with some good reference material. So I think a lot of the information Todd has in this presentation is kind of gets to that point. Does anyone have any questions for Todd? Who's? Oh, good. It's a short question. Uh, do you have a copy of that field mapping checklist? Oh yeah, probably. And it's um, yeah. Let me see if I'm. Yeah, so we don't I can have add it to the. I can probably add it to the to the available information. Great, thank you. Me next. All right, so you have an endless amount of data that you can geo reference. So do, do y'all have well defined, I guess, processes for for keeping that data available, stored somewhere in Evergreen where you can access it and. Well, so you're asking, we go out in the field, we collect all this endless amount of information and layers and model stuff. Right. And where, where does it go? Where does it go? Yeah. I think it goes in a cloud. But I don't know where that is. <laughs> you know, I mean, in the olden days, it was all on maps and sheets and physical pieces of, of paper that you would have documents on. And now we do, we put everything, everything into models and sometimes you don't have internet, you can't even access it, right? So Damien's gonna like develop an index or something that will translate a description or words or all of that stuff, right? Features into something that could be put into a table like more easily. Right. But so do you, do you have folks that keep up with this stuff or once you're done with a project, does it kind of go off into the ether and maybe yeah. maybe you revisit it a year? Do you know where the data? Yeah, no. Right. So they're, yeah, they're yeah. Their job is to try and right. So just remember that if you're getting all this data, you need a group of folks to support you mm -hmm. with recording and documenting, and it and it is not easy at all. Yeah. No, that's a good question. So Joe, you got something? Great presentation, Todd. Uh, I got a question in terms of, uh, do you have any examples for the liquefaction mapping? I know as we do these risk assessments, uh, a failure mode that we always seem to, uh, I guess, exclude is, is liquefaction, whether it be seismic induced or uh, seismicity. I guess kind of what comes to mind is, uh, you were speaking of Telling's dams is in Brazil, Brumagino, which I think was static liquefaction that occurred. And uh, do you know if by any chance any Type of liquefaction mapping was done on that because that was kind of a huge landslide that, that occurred. Of, um, of life loss. You're talking about for a for a dam, yeah. Like liquefaction mapping or understand you reference that. I guess in one of your slides, you, you mm -hmm. well. So there's liquefaction hazard maps all, all over. California has a ton. I know Oregon and Washington have liquefaction hazard maps, and they they map all the all the quaternary type deposits and they rank it to its susceptibility. So those maps exist where that hazard is present. I don't know if it's every single place and Justin probably knows a heck of a lot more about this than I do, but um, there's a lot of mapping and, and trying to depict the type of materials, depth and age, all those three things go together then to build the susceptibility maps that they have in California and elsewhere. So those exist, but you may be asking about like a tailing dam. Yes, that was more because you know typically when we go through these this risk assessments, right? We always exclude, we end up always seem to excluding size 
failure modes in liquefaction of sands to the embankment order. I think so. Yeah, so I'll just say that table Yeah, yeah, that's so thank you. Uh, I mean Justin did did a lot of that work, I think. Yeah, so there's to support the St. Louis area but the large floodplain area, they have a pretty big size and hazard from the standard size zone. So, um and yeah, like Amy was saying it's really, you know, what we're looking at is the loose sands are the most effective things. Uh, you know, in Idaho, they have uh, actually had a lot of those, so it's uh, really goes hand in hand with the food morphology because you see the various deposits. They have all these loose, young, fake materials that are highly susceptible. But actually, if you can do it, probably very quickly, we're moving into the probabilistic stage. It's been just a pretty time. Um, You're bored. Before you. Uh, Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of different types of mapping. For example, that, that do the same thing, the susceptibility mapping. Uh, there's really cool stuff in Colorado Front Range where they've mapped out the, the expansive bedrock units and where it's um, where it's where it's really bad and where it's less bad. So there's there's lots of available information. I don't know where the um, presentation is for the. Uh, Next thing. So I didn't get that uploaded to Huddle. On oh. I'm sorry, Olivia. Can I pull it off? She's gonna. No, Olivia's gonna get it. Yeah, she's got it. So just a few minutes. Any oh. other questions for Todd or anyone else in the group? Who's, so we have geologists and geotechs. Geologists probably all went to field camp. Raise your hands. That's probably your. Uh, that's probably of your duties, sorry. right? <laughs> So in field camp, you really learn how to put things on a map and how to draw contacts and faults and those sorts of things. And the symbology is pretty, pretty ingrained. But we all go to field camp in different parts of the world and learn different, different, different. Black Hills of South Dakota. South Dakota. That every awesome. all the geos here yeah. went to field camp. Actually, you, you skipped it. I guess that's more oh, okay. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Fair. I think that's where the, the geologist is made when you're an undergraduate. Yeah. You take all these classes, you learn all these things, then you get out in the field and you're like, oh, you mean I had to remember all this stuff? <laughs> but it's fun. That was fun. That was the fun part of undergrad yeah. for me. Does, does anybody have like a project where kind of some targeted field mapping um, help helped inform inform and understand the conditions. I bet TVA probably boon. <laughs> recently, we had we're doing another major project. So very recently, we're doing another major well, a mod uh, at one of our dams and field mapping. We hired some folks to come in and field mapping, and so the the lithology this. The stratigraphy was updated. The TVA mapped it wrong when they built the the dam, and yeah, and then the so the the formation actually that the the, the dam will be founded upon is much less likely. It's it's karst, but it's much or it's limestone, but it's much less likely to have karst than what it was stuff. It may have been formally mapped as yeah, yeah. Well, it's a great thing. Like, yeah, it, we yeah, and we found it because we went outside of yeah. the dam. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's it's not not like dam specific. So that was a six. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Yes. All right. When I was at the RMC, I think I was talking about 
to help investigate this outcrop. Kind of, uh, I guess, paint the picture of what happened geologically. Um, out, I guess, in Prada, you got it's kind of like a taco in essence, but you only had half of it. So, trying to you know get your stripe your on the limb of a fall, basically trying to correlate your outcrop to this put one side to the yeah. other. And so, that was it's a little bit complex in terms of what we we're doing. And so, uh, part of that was they were doing the coring for concrete, and we got to see, I guess, not really coring for. Foundation material, but you would well, peek down there. We got, yeah, we did that. So, uh, and we also kind of hit the, uh, the shear zone that was that's through there as well. So, yeah, very interesting. So, yeah. So, what was the most challenging part about mapping that? It was off. It was, yeah, it was pretty challenging. Um, actually, seeing the picture, I would say, because you have, I guess, uh, the outcrop on, I guess I want to say the the left abutment of the spillway and, you know, as the dam is built in, I, I had a hard time correlating that. Um, and, you know, even with strike and dip, it just, I couldn't get, I had a hard time lining up where I see it on this side of the outcrop, but I don't see it on that side. Uh, that was kind of, I guess, probably the difficult part. Yeah. Well, the other part is that the bedrock was exposed was like 40 feet above the spillway, right? And the rocks are dipping. So when you're mapping, yeah. you have to project. Yeah. Hey, down hit. So you have an accurate release of 40 feet. Right. Right. It was a good learning experience. Yeah, and what's really confusing sometimes is how a contact, that contact, then you put it in topography and how it goes up and down the slope. And you might look and go, oh, something's weird, but it's really, it's just doing its outcrop pattern and it's, and it's natural. Um, a lot of times, so, so I mentioned South America and being in mining, mining world is brutal. It takes days, maybe weeks of hiking around with people to start to put it all together because it's huge ore body. And we're looking at this tiny little zone that's 